Is your family tree a mystery? Are you fascinated by genealogy? Well, hip hip hooray, let's talk DNA with Julie. The truth is in your genes. In Cut Off Genes. <laughs> Welcome to Cut Off Genes, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I'm Julie Dixon Jackson, and I'm a genetic genealogist, henceforth known as a Gen Genie. And I am Richard Castle, the co host and producer of this podcast. How are you doing, Julie? I am well. And you, sir? I'm doing well. Good. A little tired. You know, I was uh, awakened in the middle of the night um, by a, well, we had a little break in in <gasps> our garage, you know, in my building. And Raccoon? No. Oh, human? A human. Oh, a human. <gasps> oh no. Oh, yeah. So, li- so listen, and this is, it does tie into DNA, folks. So listen. This cool. Is not, yeah. I mean, in, in the most, you know, far, benign <laughs> way. Benign way. <laughs> so yeah, like I want to say it was 2.30 in the morning. I sound like this is the beginning of a Dragnet episode. Well, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I carry a badger. Yeah. <laughs> and I heard the car alarm going off downstairs and I heard someone yelling. Was it, it your car or just a car alarm? A, a car. Okay. You know, and, and uh, so I ran downstairs and of course I... I Looked out the window as I'm putting on my shirt to run outside, and I see some guy go by on a bike, and I'm like, "Oh, that's not good." And I hear this little click, click, click sign, and I see my neighbor running after him with a tr- with a taser. <laughs> with Seriously? The- yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wow, yeah. vigilanteism at its finest. So you know, he co- he comes back. He didn't catch the guy, but he got the bike back because the, apparently the guy oh, damaged the damaged the bike as he was leaving and couldn't ride it very far, and and, and so he ditched it and took off on foot. And so my neighbor brought back the bike, and he's got the taser. I'm like, you're a badass, you know, like. <laughs> Is it legal to own a taser? It must be because you know why I I know it is because we he had called the cops and when the and the police showed up and the taser was there and we talked all about it and l- oh. reviewed the security footage and all that and they didn't say boo about it so I I guess it is legal to own a taser. Wow. Ooh, yeah. But anyway, so he's so you know we've had break-ins before in our garage they always go after the bikes or whatever. And he's so incensed about it because it's happened so many times, and I get it. It's, but you know, my thing is then don't leave your bike in the garage. Really, I mean, mm-hmm. bring it inside if that if that constantly keeps but happening. It's your garage. I know. I get what you're saying. Yeah. But but it happens, it sucks and that we, we have live to do in that. Los Angeles, and it's a city, and you know. So anyway, and he's he's asking them, "Are you going to dust for fingerprints? We're going to get like DNA evidence." And I'm thinking, these cops don't care about this. They're this so- happens. On the regs, guys. Yeah, yeah, and there's, and I mean, there are far worse crimes going on in Los Angeles. And if you, the worst that happens is your your bike is stolen, and you get it back after chasing him down the street with your taser. Right. Consider yourself lucky. Yeah. You know. Right. But, but anyway, so yes, I'm a little. If I'm a little slow today, it's because of that. Hey, I have uh, a correction slash clarification corner that is rather important. Oh, please. So last week when I was doing the uh, 10 things you didn't know about this U.S. census. Yes, I Apparently remember. I skipped number six. Oh. <laughs> so, Gosh, it um, didn't seem short at the time. I so. know. <laughs> but that's probably why I did because I felt like I was taking too long. So uh, let's go. And this is really important, actually. I missed number six. And that is the census racial definitions have fluctuated wildly over time. Okay. Um. This is, this is hard to read, frankly, and you'll see why. Uh, during the first few censuses, the government essentially lumped the country into two racial categories, white and black. But from 1850 to 1920, with the exception of 1900, it enumerated mixed-race mulattoes as well. Quadroons. What is that? Defined as those with one-fourth black blood. And octoroons defined as those with one-eighth black blood, were counted in 1890 and then never again. So the reason that they did that was that there were, I don't know if you want to say scientists, but there were people in an effort to keep black people down, um, believed that black people were far less intelligent than white people. So does this tie into eugenics, the whole idea of like... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. I mean, eugenics wasn't a thing then, but it was definitely because black people weren't humans back then to them. And, and didn't at one time they count slaves as like one, like there was a fraction of a human being basically like. They, 
Oh. Remember that? I don't, I don't, that's going to, we'll have to look that I'm up. I'm not sure about that. I know that when they did start counting slaves in the uh, census, they would not say their names. They would just identify them as one. Right. You know, by their age. Right. Um, which is horrifying. Um, but, so it was believed that obviously white people were superior and black people were not. However, if a black person had any white blood in them, they were considered a smarter black person. Is that so? Yeah, that's so that's why they divided them by by how much quadroons yeah, and, and how much per, what the percentage of, of blood they had. Oh, that's yeah. crazy. Isn't that awful? Oh my God. Yeah. Um it's mean, so ugly, right? Yeah. It's so it makes it's me feel horrible. Like I'm it makes gonna my take skin a shower, crawl. you know? Mm-hmm. Ugh. Yeah, it's awful. Uh, Meanwhile, those of Chinese, Japanese, and American Indian descent started being counted at various points in the late 1800s. For three decades, Hindu was a category, whereas a category for Koreans was added in 1920, taken out in 1950, and then added back in 1970. So, and this is something you will notice when you look at the census. Each 10 years, the census tells you different things. Yes. Like in some years, you know you're going to get what state this person was born in and also what state their parents were born in, which is very helpful when you're trying to figure out if this person is the right person you're looking for. Other times, it doesn't say anything like uh, about that, but it gives you other information that may be helpful. Sure. I mean, but can you imagine like, uh, all right, say, you know, I remember watching Alex Haley's Roots and reading the book. You know, you couldn't, he couldn't have gone back to the census to find a specific person because you said they didn't even give it by name. He was really had, he really had to go by these stories that were handed down, which is fascinating. Absolutely. But think about an African American trying to uh, trace their history and getting, you know, only being able to go back to once slavery ended yeah. because there was no way. It is, you know what? And if I have, uh, I have an acquaintance who is an African American woman who. Uh, she actually does a podcast about African American genealogy. Oh, how fascinating! And she focuses on it, and it's a whole different ball of wax oh. because you're looking at different things. She knows everything about, you know, when th- there was a mass um, uh, migration. migration from North Carolina to Mississippi, and oh. yeah, it's fascinating but very difficult. I've in cases that I've worked where people are African American from Mississippi. Uh, very, very difficult to break a case like that because uh, very little is known and there was very, very little records taken. Well, you know how we have listener requests? Yeah. You're going to have a co-host request right now. Ooh. I'd like you to f- perhaps approach this woman that you know who yeah. has that podcast. We've actually talked about it before. And see if she come on as a guest because I... I find this really fascinating, yeah. and I would love to have her on and, and hear her talk about this sort of subset of uh, genetic genealogy. That's a great idea. All right. Will do. Is that the end of our cl- clarification? That is the end <laughs> of our clarification. This is uh, also, Julie, we should never do lists of 10, because we, we always go off on tangents, and then God knows if know. we'll ever get to the end of it, or if we just skip one like we did last week. But, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We just go off and like, oh, that reminds me of a Dick Van Dyke episode. (laughs) Okay, that's on you. Yeah, exactly. I know, right? (laughs) All right. I found this fascinating. Okay. And this is DNA related, strangely enough, from two bulls, nine million dairy cows. Um, What does that mean? So (laughs) there are more than nine million dairy cows in the United States, and the vast majority of them are Holsteins, large bovines with distinctive black and white, sometimes red and white markings. They're Holsteins? They're Jewish? (laughs) Apparently so. Um, The amount of milk they produce is astonishing, and so is their lineage. So when researchers at the Pennsylvania State University, looked closely at the male lines a few years ago, they discovered that more than 99% of them can be traced back to one of two bulls, both born in the 1960s. Get out. That means among all the male Holsteins in the country, there are just two Y chromosomes. That's ridiculous. How does that happen? Well, I mean, they're bred for... Certain traits. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The females haven't fared much better. In fact, researchers say there is so much gen- genetic similarity among them, the effective population size is less than 50. If Holsteins were wild animals, that would put them in the category of cri- critically endangered species. It's pretty much one big inbred family, says Leslie Hansen, a Holstein expert. So has that meant that these uh, bulls are, you know, 
there's issues as far as their health or uh, abnormalities, you know, like we would expect when something is really inbred. Well, let's read on. Oh. <laughs> An elementary science student knows that genetic homogeneity isn't good in, long, in the long term. Right. It increases the risk of inherited disorders while also reducing the ability of a population to evolve in the face of a changing environment. Dairy farmers struggling to pay bills today aren't necessarily focusing on the evolutionary prospects of their animals, but researchers were concerned enough that they wanted to look more closely at what traits had been lost. Yeah. Yeah. For answers, the researchers have begun breeding a small batch of new cows cultivated in part from the preserved semen of long deceased bulls. I want to know why they have... Why did they have that in the first place? Maybe it's in their drawer next to their nightstand, like their kids' teeth. Like their kids' teeth. This was my bull's semen. I froze it. Oh, my God. I keep it right next to my children's teeth. I'm sure they do cow IVF all the time. This is where I keep all my bodily fluids and things that have come out of my body and my children. That is disgusting. Like a a drawer of horrors. The drawer of horror. (laughs) It's the the next horror movie, right? (laughs) Drawer of horrors. Anywho, uh, so they have preserved semen, semen to measure a host of characteristics, height, weight, milk production, overall health, fertility, and Utter health, among other traits. Utter health. <laughs> That's what I said. Utter health. Utter health. I mean, I'm, I'm in utter hell. Is that what uh, you yeah, were going to say? Would, no, I was going to say I was utterly disgusted by this this semen of the bull in the drawer. But anyway, stop saying semen. <laughs> you, you keep saying preserved semen. So preserved semen sounds better than just plain semen. I don't know why. Oh, well, all right. I'm not going to go there, but okay. All right, fine. Um, (laughs) The hope is that they might one day be able to inject some sorely needed genetic diversity back into this cornerstone of livestock agriculture and possibly reawaken traits that have been lost to relentless inbreeding. Yeah, I'd be interested to know what those traits are and how they, yeah. Like, why did they breed them out? Because they didn't even think about it. They right. don't think about the cows. Right. They, you know. But, like, they probably bred them for, like, I don't know, how well they taste or how well they reproduce or how well they do this, you know? Yeah. How strong they are, how long they live or, you know, how big they can get. I wonder if it's for, for cows to eat or cows for the milk. Mm. I wonder if it makes a difference. We'll have to look that up. I, apparently. I, I always find the whole breeding thing interesting in like kind of a sick way. Like even yeah. with dogs, I look at all the different dogs. And you go, oh, my God, like they bred this dog to have a flat face. Yeah. You know? and, and like my, my niece has this cute little, um, I think it's a, a Boston Terrier. Yeah. You know, and he's always like, in the, it's summertime, so he's always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it just looks like he's in pain. Face. And he's, he's very, very sweet. Yeah. But like, oh, my God. You know, we take him on a walk and he he can't go very far. He has oh, to yeah. drink his water and like, yeah. I get it. Yeah. He's got no... They have asthma. Yeah. Well, well, they sound like they go. have asthma. I saw a bull terrier at the vet the other day that had the most pronounced nose bump I have ever seen. Really? It was like super bump. It looked like a horn almost. It was crazy. You know what I realized? What? This episode is full of bull. <laughs> We talked about the Holstein bulls, and, and now you're talking about a bull terrier. Oh, bull. I yeah. was wondering where you... I was like, what are we getting at here? <laughs> you really didn't get it? No. We just finished talking about the bulls. You're, well, we haven't finished yet. Oh, my God. Oh, wait. Yeah, we have. But I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, in other <laughs> words, uh, we could reach a point that we're stuck where we're at. There will be no more improvement in milk production. Fertility won't improve. And if a new disease comes along, huge swaths of the cow population could be susceptible since so many of them have the same genes. Well, vegans around the world are cheering. Yeah, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. But that's interesting. That's, yeah. It's true. Maybe that's it, a circle of life thing or a natural order thing. I don't right. know. Right. That's why you shouldn't. We need the diversity. Diversity right? is good in everything. It is. It really is. It is. I mean, that's why, like you said, why, why is it that when you have two children separately mm-hmm. that they don't look exactly alike? Because there's some genes that are passed down and some that are not. Right. So breeding is just, oh. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, you don't Eugenics. have two children that... It, two years apart that look exactly, that are genetically exactly alike. Right. right? Although one might argue that my children are that. (laughs) They look pretty much alike. It's creepy. But I mean, they're not like, you didn't have two girls that look exactly the same. You had a girl and a boy. Well, those would be called twins. Yes. No, but I mean, Oh, two years apart, I see. Yes. Yeah, it's fascinating. Nature does that for a reason. I'll take a break. Okay. 
If you're enjoying Cut Off Jeans, please subscribe, rate, and review. Now, back to Julie and me. So I found this article from Carrie Scott, who is a legacy tree genealogist. And it's about 13 secrets to getting replies from DNA cousin matches. Okay, just just cousin matches? Well, they're all cousins. Everybody's oh. considered a cousin because they can't differentiate. We're all cousins. Oh. Yeah. All right, cuz, tell me the rest. Okay, cuz. Um, <laughs> cousin Julie. <laughs> so they're talk, she's talking about when you, it's, it's a common fact that it's very difficult to get responses from people on, answers, on most of the, the DNA sites. Yeah. They're either not interested or they don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there, here are some tricks to get your point across or to get through to somebody or make sure they read it. Um, I, however, am going to modify for the adoptee or for people that have unknown parentage. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to put my input from what she says to what part of that needs to be changed for our particular situation. Yeah, that's good because not all, like, it's not one size fits all, right? I mean... Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, especially w- when you're an adoptee as opposed to someone just looking for, you know, a, co- yes. a cousin that... Yes. That, yeah. So I'm going to include uh, common mistakes adoptees make, oh. too, for and what not to do if you're reaching out to family. Well, I will cede the floor to my cousin Julie. Very good. <laughs> Cuz. All right. So if you see a cousin who has a real email address in their profile, use it. The internal messaging systems of DNA sites aren't reliable. We all know that. And not everyone logs in often enough to see the message. Um, on some subscription sites, users can't always access the messages if their subscription has lapsed. Uh, if you have to use the site's messaging system, it's a good idea to put your own email address in both the subject line and your profile. I always do that. Mm. I have my email address and everything. Uh, the user may not see the whole message, but they'll likely see the subject line. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that I didn't know. Second, use a Gmail account. When you're sending that email, you'll want the best possible chance of making it through the spam filter. Email from sites like Comcast and AOL can sometimes be flagged as junk. This is all new to me. Wow. Well, oh, AOL especially, I would think, because that's so old. And, that explains yeah. so much. Gmail tends to be the email provider that triggers the fewest filters. Hmm. And it's nice to have a dedicated email address for your genealogical research. Hmm. Okay. Make your subject line sing. Newly tested cousins are likely to receive lots of messages from others eager to figure out how they're related. If you want to make sure your email is open first, use a subject line that grabs their attention. If I was going to make it sing, I would probably have it sing people. <laughs> <laughs> you'd open it up and you'd hear Barbara Streisand saying people who need people are the luckiest I people would in the world. I would open that thing yeah, you immediately. Would. And also, it also, it makes sense because you're looking for people. <laughs> That's the most genius thing you've ever said. Well, there you go. Yeah, I think it's true. Um, yeah, so if you say uh, something like so-and-so is my great-grandpa, I think is yours too, is a way more fun than DNA cousin or hello. Right. Right. Which is true. Now, let's go to let's go to adoptees. But you don't want to have like clickbait like guess what I know about you. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. Never good. No. So, if you're an adoptee and I've this comes up a lot when I'm working with adoptees who have been trying to figure it out themselves for several months. And what I notice is they have already contacted most of the people that I'm about to contact and they've given the story away already. Mm. They say, hi, I'm adopted. I don't know anything. Was there anybody in your family that gave up a child? Mm. Do not do that, everybody. (laughs) Such a mistake. A, they know the whole story now, and they're going to decide whether or not they're interested in helping you. B, nobody knows, especially a second cousin, does not know who in their family gave up a child. Right. What we're wanting more than anything is for them to tell us who their grandparents and great-grandparents are so that we can build our own tree from that. We don't need to tell them us any more personal information than who are these people, where are they from, what are their approximate birth dates, so that then you can do your work or my work and build a quick and dirty tree and see what the connection is. Right. So we're not asking them to do the work for us. We just want them to help us with simple facts. Right, because the other thing is they, they may not they may be going down the wrong path and then you've alerted people, you know, or you've maybe even alarmed them 
you know, without absolutely. reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? It's never, I never, ever, ever recommend somebody leading with I'm adopted. It's mm. just not a smart thing to do. Right. Okay. And everybody does it. Yeah. I've looked, because in on 23 and Me, I, I can't access their results. I have to actually look into their account so I can see all the uh, messages they've had right. between other people. Just, they're all like, I'm adopted. I don't know anything. Can you help me? And it's just... Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's a mistake. That's probably the biggest mistake adoptees make. God bless them. God yeah, bless them. They just want, I get they it. want information. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. And I bet I did that too way back in the beginning. Well, you, you, you're giving good advice then to people who are just starting their search. Boy, have I learned. <laughs> okay. Number four, be very specific. You can't always tell by looking, but many DNA codes are managed by someone who is also managing dozens of other kits across multiple DNA testing companies. This is good. It can be frustrating to re- receive a message that says, it looks like we're third cousins. Do you have a tree? Well, maybe, but whose third cousin are you? So in my case, I manage tons of of DNA tests. And if somebody doesn't click from the DNA pat- match page, um, then I'm not going to see who the match is. Right. If it's from the match page, it will show what the connection is. But if it's not, if they just went to my uh, user page, they'll just say, uh, it looks like we have this. And I'm like, who are you? Who are you connected to? I see, yeah. Yeah, so that's a problem. Specificity is always your friend. Right. Um, here's another one. Okay, share who you are and what you know, not for adoptees. One of the fun things about working with DNA cousins is there's such a huge spectrum of experience levels. One cousin might have been given a test as a gift with no clue that there's a whole world of of research out there to go along with that gift. Another might be a professional genealogist with decades of experience. To break the ice and speed things up, it's a good idea to give a sense of your experience level up front. If you have a sense of what the connection is to this new cousin, connection to this new cousin might be, say so. If you're completely in the dark, it's fine to admit it. Setting expectations up front starts your relationship off on the right foot. And the caveat is, unless you're an adoptee and they are a close match. Mm. Once again, you have to be as vague as possible. Like, hey, we're first cousins. Do you think you know how we are connected? If you've gotten as far as knowing what line connects you, you can throw that name out mm-hmm. so that they know where to look and they can tell you who their grandparents are, et cetera. Okay. Come bearing gifts. If you're lucky enough to have a pretty good idea as to how you connect to this new cousin, you can lure them. Few genealogists can resist the three words we all want to hear. I have photos. <laughs> it's true. If you don't have photos, you might have other stuff this new cousin would enjoy. An ancestor whose U.S. Civil War pension file is filled with some pretty juicy stuff. And I've yet to find a cousin on that line who didn't want to know just what that juicy stuff entails. Yeah. And, and if you're reaching out to me, it, the subject line should be, I have cupcakes, because that's my weakness. Oh, that's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So just so you know. Good to know. <laughs> Thank you. If your cousin is Richard Castle, <laughs> say, I have cupcakes. That's one more caveat. <laughs> Don't fixate on trees. This is really important. Many genealogists email a new cousin asking for a tree and they're disappointed when they don't get a response. Most people, I'm at a point now where I don't, I rely, if they do have a tree, I rely on it just to start the new branch. Um, But if they don't at all, I can still reach out to them and ask them, as I just said, the names of their great grandparents. Right. And build a tree strictly from that. It's it's the whole quick and dirty extravaganza sure. that we learned um, in previous episodes. So it's just a fact that most new DNA testers today are not genealogists and they don't have trees. Yeah, I mean... It's it, just it, the way it is. Yeah, most people are just... They're starting out and they don't know all the things you know because, right. you know... Right, so don't be disappointed. Do your reaching out. You're going to have to do a lot more detective work. Um, and if you don't feel like doing that, call me and I'll do it. (laughs) That's right. There you go. Um, remember that this is a job application. This is important. When you're contacting a new cousin, you're applying for the opportunity to work with them. The odds that you'll get the opportunity to do that are much greater if you show your great colleague. The tone of your message can go a long way to establishing that this is going to be fun. And always wear a suit and tie. That's yes. what my mother used to say. You're going First on impression, an, best yeah, impression. Going on an interview, you got to wear your suit and tie. And your best shoes. Yeah, make like, sure but, they're polished. Like, but my, it's McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not like I'll be wearing that at the register. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually never applied at McDonald's, but similar. I did. did First you? job. Yep. Really? Yep. I worked at I worked at Shaw's. It was a supermarket in, in Massachusetts when I was a kid. I always wanted to work at a supermarket. I was a bag boy. And I, you know what? I was a bad bag boy because I... You I, put the eggs I, underneath. No, you the, know what it was? Yeah. Is they, always, they always used to send me out to collect the um, carriages, you know, yes. the shopping car- carts. And it was snowing and it was like trying <gasps> to push all those carts through the snow and I hated it. I was like, what is my little piano hands doing <laughs> pushing these heavy carts? In the snow. In the snow. And Southern California's... Four years. Uh, Southern Californians, we don't understand no, what that means. No, but people back east will know exactly what I'm talking about. Be open to multiple ways of working together. People of all different ages are having their DNA tested. Some older people are Luddites or just don't like using the computer. It's amazing that they even have um, have a computer to do the DNA, frankly. Right. Well, no, somebody <laughs> might have given them, um, yes. you know, gotten them a test and, and set it up for them. But, but so, yeah, I get that. Exactly. Everybody's different. Everybody's different. And so you have to adjust. Some people are, are on Facebook. Um, some aren't, some people would prefer video conferencing. Some people want to do snail mail. Um, so just be open to whatever is more comfortable for them because you want them to help you. Also, I, I offer help back. Oh, that's nice. I mean, I tell them, you know, this is what I do for a living. Maybe, you know, maybe I can help you with some of your questions too. That's nice. Quid pro quo. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Consider your digital footprint. Okay. When I started doing genealogical research, we had to get to know cousins by actually getting to know them. Those days are over. Now people look you up online before they contact you. Is your online persona helping or hurting your efforts to attract cousins? Oh, that's a that's a really good one. And that's actually a good one for not for, for anything, for a job interview. Absolutely. For anything. Absolutely. If somebody's gonna look you up, you don't want to yep. have something that's embarrassing or yep. that gives a, a bad impression of what mm-hmm. You know, a different impression than what you're trying to do when you're getting a job or something. Yeah. Precisely. I did not know this because I haven't had to look for a job where they would look me up in a long time. Mm -hmm. But yes, companies go and look you up on social media before they hire you. And they, you know. Right. (laughs) They do. I, I, you know, I I try my best not to uh, be too opinionated on my Facebook page. (laughs) <laughs> Just give it the old college try, Julie. <laughs> Needless to say, that doesn't work well. But I also find a lot of people on uh, social media when I'm looking that are potential family of people that I'm helping that when I see what their what their page is about, it kind of gives me a sinking feeling because they're not going to be welcoming. Right, right. Um, and I feel badly for, for the client because, you know, I did I mention this before? I have, I have a client who's, who's openly gay, and a, I found a cousin of his. I don't think she's a very close cousin, I hope. But her Facebook page led with, like, the picture had a thing about straight pride. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And I was horrified. I was like, please, please don't be somebody that's important. Right. (laughs) That can help. Uh. You know, to each to each his own. But it's it's really disappointing when when ideologies are so different. Yes. Um, But I guess, you know, that's what makes horse races. That's humanity. Yeah. Oh, the humanity. Yes. The humanity. Straight pride. Yes. Get over that. Straight pride. Pride. Okay, number 12, don't take it personally. This is good. Sometimes you've done absolutely everything right and you just don't get a reply. Yeah. We have to accept that. People have lives. People aren't interested. We can't make people help us. And that's what I have. It, I, I'm really hard on myself when that, when that happens. And it happens a lot because I'm helping other people. And I feel like I need to leave no stone unturned. And I get that. But, yeah. you know, it, it, is a, it is good advice to not take it personally. Because sometimes it may not be what you think. And you maybe know? it's for the best. Well, no, but like sometimes people just, they don't read their email. Or, or mm-hmm. they are so busy, they just haven't gotten to you. Yeah. Or, you know, oh, yeah. I've, I've gotten responses from things that I posted eight years ago. Yeah, it's not, it's <laughs> not because of you. It's not, they're not doing it to you. They probably haven't even seen it. You know, the new messaging system is supposed to be unrolling on uh, Ancestry. 
yes. but I, there's nothing new for me. What about you guys? Has anybody got it yet? Was there some kind of um, like a test group that was using it or something? I or? think it was. I think newer users were getting it first, uh, and and I think I was one that was supposed to get it the latest because I've actually utilized the file uh, system in their old messaging system. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I don't know, but if anybody has it, please let us know because I'm uh, chomping at the bit. Okay. To use it. All right. Finally, be patient. Genealogy is a long game. Ain't that the truth? Um, it can take, I, and I always tell clients this, I can do this in possibly hours. It could be days. It could be months. It could be years. So you have to be prepared to yes. play the long game yes. and be patient. And just know that eventually things always, uh, always come to fruition. Uh, it could be many years down the line. Yeah. And we have to accept that if we're going to pursue this. So there. Shall we take a break? Yes, we shall. Thank you for listening to Cut Off Jeans with Julie Dixon Jackson and Richard Castle. That's me. Story time. Great. So this is, we have uh, the daughter of the woman that you spoke with the last two weeks, right? Exactly. Oh. This is Jill Gounder's biological daughter. I've been waiting for this. Yeah. Yes. We've heard uh, Jill tell the story. Now Carolyn has her point of view. Um, interesting how similar they are. Is it? Yeah. Uh. It's fascinating. Um, Caroline was really fun to talk to. And uh, yeah, we talked for ever it seemed like so this will probably be a couple of episodes long just to warn everybody oh that's right <laughs> expect okay. two parts yes so <laughs> let's hear part one of caroline hodges hey everybody i have on the line caroline hodges who is jill gounder's biological daughter who we spoke to uh last week hi caroline hi how are you i'm great i'm so happy to be talking to you after hearing jill's story me too. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Okay, so you um, are an adoptee. I am. Like myself. So tell me a little bit, tell me your story and tell me, you know, basically starting at the beginning, which is a very sure. good place to start. Usually is. Yeah. Um, so I was born February 8th, 1983 in North Hollywood, California. Mm -hmm. I was adopted out at three days old, uh, directly from the hospital, and my adopted family lived in Wichita, Kansas at the time. Okay. So they basically come home. I think they took my brother out to a movie, came home on their answering machine. It was basically, it's a girl, come get her. Wow. <laughs> so they uh, book flights and they fly out and pick me up. And so, I mean, my story pretty much started, you know, with them at the very beginning. So I never knew anything else. Right. So we fly home and start my life. Um, mm -hmm. My brother is six years older than me. He is also adopted. My two cousins on my mom's side of the family, um, they are both adopted as well. We're a big smorgasbord of a family. Sure. Um, no one's biologically related. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of normal for us. Yeah. Um, always just grew up knowing. Um, you know, it was actually until I was a little bit older that I realized being adopted was different because um, that's all I had known. Right. Now, is this something that you openly talked about where you, where your parents, uh, did they think you should be secretive about it or anything now? No, 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 no. Okay, good. It's always yeah. been very open. They were very open with me on, um, at least their side, obviously they yeah. can only speak on, um, why I was adopted. Um, there was some genetic mutation, um, with my mom and her sister where they couldn't have healthy children. Okay. And they each had, had biological children who, who didn't survive. Mm. And so that's why, you know, all of us are adopted. Sure. And okay. Yeah, it's great. It's great. So, well, I mean, that's all we knew. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> this is how it is. So cool. Um, but it was never, it was never anything hidden. Um, but it also wasn't anything that was discussed constantly. Right. You know, cause it was just our normal and relative, you know, here and there it would come up and, but it was never like a constant topic. Right. Um, and then, you know, throughout the years, we lived in, let's see, we moved from Wichita to Cleveland. And so my like elementary school years were in Cleveland. And when we were, uh, or when I was 11 is when we moved to Oklahoma. Okay. 
so at that time, my brother was graduating high school and didn't want to come to Oklahoma and stayed behind. So he's actually still living in Cleveland. Okay. And he's 42. We, we were very different people. Yep. Um, I think we still are, but mm-hmm. I think we do have a lot of similarities as well. And it's just kind of funny because I, what I feel like our similarities are between me and Alex mm-hmm. is we're very different from our parents. Right. Alex and I are more loud, you know, more mm-hmm. outgoing, um, maybe a little more extreme. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> we just, you know, yeah. lived a little wilder than, than our parents did. Um, you're you're so, more outwardly um, expressive. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, and, and we'd always have jokes about, you know, growing up, of, you know, of our parents parents embarrassed us or like, oh it's cool I'm adopted so I'm mm-hmm. not to you know I mean it was you know we always joked about it it was a light-hearted topic right. right it was probably as normal of a situation as you could get absolutely it sounds like so when did you start wondering or thinking about finding your biological mother um I think the curiosity was always there yeah um you know especially being born in Hollywood yeah, and I knew I knew um, my parents had both been in show business. Um, exactly in what capacity, I wasn't exactly sure. Um, Did you got, have like fantasies that they were like famous or something? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say fantasies, but we'd always guess, or yeah. you know, people would okay, well, who was famous at the time? Yeah, who did you look like you know, who could it be? People and, used to do that with me all yeah. the time. Really? Yeah. A psychic once told me that she thought my mother was um, Jeannie Little, who was a famous Australian oh, how funny. Uh, comedian who was known just for being obnoxious. So I thought that was funny. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I, think, I think the best one I got was, well, I knew little pieces. I knew my mother was a dancer, Mm -hmm. actress. I knew my father was a singer, actor. Um, they weren't sure if my mother sang or not. And so, you know, singing and dancing early eighties who kind of became famous at the time who was short. Um, cause I'm only five, two. Um, so the who big running it? joke, Paul Abdul, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's got the big brown eyes like me, the dark hair. Sure. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of the running joke um, for funny. a while that Paul Abdul was, was my mother. I love it. Um, Obviously, I never, you know, held anything to that other than just a joke. Of course. But, um, you know, it was always just fun to joke about. <laughs> but so, I mean, the wondering was always there. Um, and and not just as far as the show business part. I mean, as far as, you know, the, yeah. you know, she think of me, you know, every year on my birthday, she thinking of me, you know, the normal, I think, wonderment of, of being an adoptee. Right. Okay. So I remember the first time I really brought it up to my parents and wanted to actually make a, take a step to, to try and find her, um, was, I was probably around 13, 14. Um, so it was just a few years after we had moved to Tulsa, um, you know, middle school years, adolescence, awkward years, you know, it was just kind of a tough time. Yep. And so I brought it up to them and they were completely supportive. And, um, my dad helped me find the attorney that had done the adoption because it was through a private attorney. It wasn't through an agency or anything like that. My dad called him and he basically said, okay, write me a letter. Um, so I have it, you know, in paper and, um, I'll see what I can do. Send you what information I can. Okay. So like 14 years old, I write this letter and never sent it. Okay. I just didn't feel ready. I knew, you know, through conversations with, with my parents, as well as just, I don't know, just thinking through things on my own. I was just like, there could be any scenario. It could be, she doesn't want to find me. She could be dead. She could have another family. She could, you know, all these scenarios. Sure. So if it's not the, you know, rainbows and sunshine ending, I don't know if I'm ready to deal with this. That's very smart for a 13 year old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's good. I was like, I just don't think I'm ready for this. Yep. This is a big one. Mm-hmm. So kind of just put it in the back of my mind for the next few years go off to college. The next time I remember making an effort was I was a freshman at Florida state. So this would have been like fall of 2001 and, um, over at a friend's apartment and the subject comes up, we're drinking a lot. I'm just like unpouring my heart out about all this stuff. I didn't even realize I had been carrying around and it was like, okay, maybe we'll bring this up again. Well, at this point I was 
more fearful about bringing it back up to my parents. It had been so many years and I just, I didn't want to hurt them. Even though, you know, I kept telling myself, I know that's all in my head. You know, they've been supported before. There's no reason why they wouldn't again, but you know, there's just always that fear. I don't, I don't want to hurt them. So I finally brought it back up to my parents again. And they were like, we've actually been waiting for you to bring this up. Aww. And they're like, you know, we just don't feel like it's our place yeah. to say anything. If, if you're not in a place, you don't want to like deal with this right now. We don't want to be the ones to bring it up or whatever. So, sure. you know, that was kind of comforting. They had been waiting on me to, to, to come back on this. And you know what? I think they were intuitive enough to know that there were things about you that clearly were very different from them. And you were going to need to find an origin for that stuff. Right. You right. Know? And so I think once I just brought it up, then they were like, okay, green light game on. Let's do this. Awesome. So my dad tracks down the lawyer uh, a second time. It, it took a little bit longer to find him this time. He gave me his number and I called and a uh, woman answered. And I said, you know, hello, my name is Caroline and I'm um, looking, you know, to speak with so-and-so. Um, he handled my adoption. Uh, I guess I was about 19 at the time. So he handled my adoption 19 years ago and I'm trying to find some information. Is he still at this number? And she just kind of paused and was like, didn't know what to say. Mm. It was just, uh, uh, well, yeah, he's here, but, um, and I was like, well, can I speak with him? And she's like, okay. And just kind of passed the phone. I'm like, oh God, where is this about to go? He got on the phone and just didn't sound coherent. Uh-huh. I don't know if he was drunk. I don't know if he had a stroke. I don't, he just, but you could tell just something went right. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really get much out of that. He basically said, all the files have been destroyed. Don't ever call me again. And hung up. Oh, and that was it. Weird. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How do you sit with that? Yeah. It's so strange. (laughs) From there, I'm just kind of, now what? All the files have been destroyed. So, I mean, there's nothing to even search for. What do I do? How did the files get destroyed? Like I absolutely no answers. Yeah. But at that point, I just took it as, like, this is a steel door slammed in my face. Like, that's it. Yeah. If all the files have been destroyed, there's nothing else to do. So that put that to bed for, oh, gosh, 15 years, 16 years. I mean, never really came up again. You know, people would ask me, and I'd be like, you know, they said all the files have been destroyed. So that's kind of it. Doesn't that suck? Isn't that an awful feeling? Ugh. Ugh. It is draining. It's horrible. Yeah. It's just like the biggest punch to the gut. Yep. Yep. Ever. Yep. So it kind of had come up in the last few years just because I had um, multiple friends at the time struggling with infertility and I had some friends going through IVF and some friends considering adoption. So the topic just kind of came up more um, just kind of in general of my friends. And I was just telling them about my experience and, you know, if we're thinking of adopting a child, like from your perspective, what should we know? And, and I'm more than willing, ask me anything. If I don't want to answer, I'll just tell you, but I'm probably just going to answer you the best I can. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the topic was just kind of in my life a little bit more. Yeah. It was just a topic of conversation more in my life, but of course that kind of piqued my interest again. There had been, you know, a few attempts here and there. Let me see what I can find out if there's anything from the hospital. Well, then I found out the hospital was torn down. Okay, there's another door yeah. slammed, you know. So then I call the, I think, like, California State Health Department. Mm-hmm. And they basically said, well, you know, we don't keep that kind of information longer than 20, 25 years. Well, I'm in my mid-30s, so, Okay. All right. You know, I tried something, you know, I'd make that phone call and then a few months go by nothing really. So last year, the fire in my stomach started burning again and I had been talking to my brother about it and he, let me backtrack for a minute. For the last about two, three years, every about Christmas or so, you know, all the DNA tests have their Christmas sales, whatever. My husband has been saying, for about two or three years now, like, well, why don't you take one? You, you don't even know your nationality, race, anything like that. Um, take one and just find out. I'm like, yeah, I will. I will. But I never wanted to right. yet. Like I knew I wanted to know these answers, but it was just like, am I really ready to do this yet? So this past Christmas, I was like, okay, forget it. I put it off long enough. 
Let's buy it. Let's do it. So around Christmas time, I did 23 and me. Okay. And we got, um, results back, I don't know, a couple weeks after new year's, probably mid January and got my ancestry information and everything like that, but no DNA matches closer than like third to fifth yeah. cousin. Yeah. It was nothing over 2%. But I really didn't do it expecting relatives to pop up when I got my results. Right. I don't know why I didn't. It just, I just really wanted to know what I was. Yeah. And so I Google, you know, finding birth parents and I come across a site adopted.com. And you answer questions and they kind of match you up with other people searching. And it just said, you have nine matches. You have to pay to see your matches, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. So <laughs> everything's I'm, I'm a business. A cheap, exactly. Well, yeah. I'm a cheapskate and it was like 20 bucks. And I was like, oh, I mean, what's the point? Like every, nothing else is ever, you know, nothing even small has come from anything. Like, what is the point? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, it's $20. And I was like, it's one month. Let me just look at my matches. I'll just cancel it within 30 days yeah. and be done with it. So I, I get nine matches and so I pay 20 bucks, see my matches. I whittle it down to four. Well, out of those four, there's a spot where you can just free text, write uh-huh. whatever you want. And there was only one that had anything in that, uh-huh. in that free text box. And it said, um, you know, looking for my daughter, um, you know, it already had the, um, date of birth city, all that stuff matched. Wow. Um, they, she said the attorney was passed and the hospital had been torn down. Mm-hmm. Those were the only two indicators that caught my eye. Right. At this point, I just kind of sent a generic message to all four of those matches. But on this one, I just put a little bit extra of, you know, what you said about the attorney and the hospital caught my eye. What other little pieces of information do you have that we might be able to piece together? This all happens within about 30 minutes, basically on my lunch break at work. And I like close it all out. It's out of my mind. I go back to work. I don't even think about it because I don't think anything is going to come of it because why would it? So about six hours later, <laughs> we are sitting down to dinner, set my plate down. I sit down. I, my phone buzzed. I pick it up. I'm holding my fork <gasps> in my left hand. I pick up my phone with my right hand and it says, you have a new message. And I can see the very like beginning of it. And so I open it up and it says, I've tried ser- searching, but Due to attorney deaths and lies by my ex-husband, I have been shut down. Mm -hmm. The North Hollywood Medical Center has since been torn down, so there are no birth records there either. I will never give up. So she told me the the name of the medical center. She said I was 23 years old. You know, the attorney um, took care of everything, so I don't, like, have many details. Um, Everything seems like a dead end. Um, You know, I never got to see my little girl. Um, I heard she was adopted by a family in the Kansas City area. Oh, for heaven's sake. So at that point, I read this, fork still in my left hand. <laughs> <laughs> I read Kansas City. Now, we were in Wichita, but it was still Kansas. So I'm like, okay, right. maybe she just got the city wrong, but we have the same state. Like, I am completely shaking. I felt this wave come over me uh-huh. that I've never felt before. Yep. I mean, it was a physical, I could feel, like, it was insane. And I don't know how to describe it. But I looked at my husband. He said, I was white as a ghost. I dropped my fork, which freaked out all my dogs. So they're all worried. And I'm just shaking and hyperventilating. And he's like, what? (laughs) And I somehow in my little tiny hyperventilating breaths got out. I think I found my mother. All right. End of part one. Wow. Yeah. Good times. I like, I want to hear part two. I can't wait. Hey, guess what? What? It's next week. Oh, well, you always make me wait. Thank goodness though. (laughs) You could always binge it together and not listen to this week's. Of course, I'm the producer. I could actually go ahead and listen to it beforehand, but I like to be surprised just like the, with the interview parts. I least. love that you don't even listen to it when you put it in the podcast. No, I put it in and then I listen to the whole thing and see what oh, I okay. need to what I need to cut or change or, you know, make sound prettier. Or completely delete. We like the well because yeah. Julie messed up. <laughs> oh, you should see my cutting room floor. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> filthy. It's filthy with you. <laughs> filthy with you. All right, tell people about yourself. Uh, well, my cutting room floor is filthy with Julie. But um <laughs> but uh, I am Richard Castle, and I am a musician and a composer and a songwriter. 
and a pianist. Yes, you can follow me on the Twitter at Castle Songs, or you can go to my website, richardcastle.com. Julie Dixon Jackson, find me on the Twitter at Jules Jackson with two O's. Find the podcast on Twitter, Cut Off Jeans Podcast. Find the Facebook group, Cut Off Jeans Podcast. Answer a question to join. It's really, really fun. Guys, please share with your friends. Please subscribe. Please rate. Please review. And one more thing, the truth is in your jeans. Mm-hmm.